Chapter Five of Bushido, the Soul of Japan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Awei in November two thousand and nine. Bushido, the Soul of Japan by Inazo Nitobe. Chapter Five, Benevolence, the Feeling of Distress. When valor attains this height, it becomes akin to benevolence, the feeling of distress love magnanimity affection for others sympathy and pity which were ever recognized to be supreme virtues the highest of all the attributes of the human soul benevolence was deemed a princely virtue in a twofold sense princely among the manifold attributes of a noble spirit princely as particularly befitting a princely profession we needed no shakespeare to feel though perhaps like the rest of the world we needed him to express it that mercy became a monarch better than his crown, that it was above his sceptred sway. How often both Confucius and Mencius repeat the highest requirement of the ruler of men to consist in benevolence. Confucius would say, Let but a prince cultivate virtue, people will flock to him. With people will come to him lands, lands will bring forth for him wealth, wealth will give him the benefit of right uses. Virtue is the root and wealth an outcome again never has there been a case of a sovereign loving benevolence and the people not loving righteousness mencius follows close at his heels and says instances are on record where individuals attained to supreme power in a single state without benevolence but never have i heard of a whole empire falling into the hands of one who lacked this virtue also it is impossible that any one should become ruler of the people to whom they have not yielded the subjection of their hearts. Both define this indispensable requirement in a ruler by saying, Benevolence. Benevolence is man. Under the regime of feudalism, which could easily be perverted into militarism, it was to benevolence that we owed our deliverance from despotism of the worst kind. An utter surrender of life and limb on the part of the governed would have left nothing for the governing but self-will, and this has for its natural consequence the growth of that absolutism so often called oriental despotism, as though there were no despots of occidental history. Let it be far from me to uphold despotism of any sort, but it is a mistake to identify feudalism with it. When Frederick the Great wrote that, kings are the first servants of the state jurists thought rightly that a new era was reached in the development of freedom strangely coinciding in time in the backwoods of northwestern japan yozan of yonezawa made exactly the same declaration showing that feudalism was not all tyranny and oppression a feudal prince although unmindful of owing reciprocal obligations to his vassals felt a higher sense of responsibility to his ancestors and to heaven. He was a father to his subjects, whom heaven entrusted to his care. In a sense not usually assigned to the term, Bushido accepted and corroborated paternal government, paternal also as opposed to the less interested avuncular government, Uncle Sam's to wit. The difference between a despotic and a paternal government lies in this, that in the one the people obey reluctantly, while in the other they do so with that proud submission, that dignified obedience, that subordination of heart which kept alive, even in servitude itself, the spirit of exalted freedom. The old saying is not entirely false, which called the king of England the king of devils because of his subjects often insurrections against and depositions of their princes, and which made the French monarch the king of asses because of their infinite taxes and impositions but which gave the title of the king of men to the sovereign of spain because of his subjects willing obedience but enough virtue and absolute power may strike the anglo-saxon mind as terms which it is impossible to harmonize Popiodonostsev has clearly set before us the contrast in the foundations of English and other European communities, namely that these were organized on the basis of common interest, while that was distinguished by a strongly developed independent personality. 
what this russian statesman says of the personal dependence of individuals on some social alliance and in the end of ends of the state among the continental nations of europe and particularly among slavonic peoples is doubly true of the japanese hence not only is a free exercise of monarchical power not felt as heavily by us as in europe but it is generally moderated by parental consideration for the feelings of the people absolutism says bismarck primarily demands in the ruler impartiality honesty devotion to duty energy and inward humility if i may be allowed to make one more quotation on this subject i will cite from the speech of the german emperor at koblenz in which he spoke of kingship by the grace of god with its heavy duties its tremendous responsibility to the creator alone from which no man no minister no parliament can release the monarch we knew benevolence was a tender virtue and mother-like if upright rectitude and stern justice were peculiarly masculine mercy had the gentleness and the persuasiveness of a feminine nature we were warned against indulging in indiscriminate charity without seasoning it with justice and rectitude masamune expressed it well in his oft-quoted aphorism rectitude carried to excess hardens into stiffness benevolence indulged beyond measure sinks into weakness fortunately mercy was not so rare as it was beautiful for it is universally true that the bravest are the tenderest the loving are the daring bushi no nasake the tenderness of a warrior had a sound which appealed at once to whatever was noble in us not that the mercy of a samurai was generically different from the mercy of any other being but because it implied mercy where mercy was not a blind impulse but where it recognized due regard to justice and where mercy did not remain merely a certain state of mind but where it was backed with power to save or kill as economists speak of demand as being effectual or ineffectual similarly we may call the mercy of bushi effectual since it implied the power of acting for the good or detriment of the recipient priding themselves as they did in their brute strength and privileges to turn it into account the samurai gave full consent to what mencius taught concerning the power of love benevolence he says brings under its sway whatever hinders its power just as water subdues fire they only doubt the power of water to quench flames who try to extinguish with a cupful a whole burning wagon load of faggots he also says that the feeling of distress is the root of benevolence therefore a benevolent man is ever mindful of those who are suffering and in distress thus did mencius long anticipate adam smith who founds his ethical philosophy on sympathy it is indeed striking how closely the code of knightly honor of one country coincides with that of others in other words how the much abused oriental ideas of morals find their counterparts in the noblest maxims of european literature if the well-known lines he tibi erunt artes pacisque imponere morem pacere subjectis et debellare superbos where shown a japanese gentleman he might readily accuse the mantuan bard of plagiarizing from the literature of his own country benevolence to the weak the downtrodden or the vanquished was ever extolled as peculiarly becoming to a samurai lovers of japanese art must be familiar with the representation of a priest riding backwards on a cow the rider was once a warrior who in his day made his name a byword of terror in the terrible battle of sumano ura eleven eighty four anno domini which was one of the most decisive in our history he overtook an enemy and in single combat had him in the clutch of his gigantic arms now the etiquette of war required that on such occasions no blood should be spilt unless the weaker party proved to be a man of rank or ability equal to that of the stronger the grim combatant would have the name of the man under him but he refusing to make it known his helmet was ruthlessly torn off when the sight of a juvenile face fair and beardless made the astonished knight relax his hold helping the youth to his feet in paternal tones he bade the stripling go off young prince to thy mother's side the sword of kumagaye shall never be tarnished by a drop of thy blood haste and flee o'er yon pass before thy enemies come in sight 
the young warrior refused to go and begged kumagaye for the honor of both to dispatch him on the spot above the hoary head of the veteran gleams the cold blade which many a time before has sundered the cords of life but his stout heart quails there flashes athwart his mental eye the vision of his own boy who this selfsame day marched to the sound of bugle to try his maiden arms the strong hand of the warrior quivers again he begs his victim to flee for his life finding all his entreaties vain and hearing the approaching steps of his comrades he exclaims if thou art overtaken thou mayest fall at a more ignoble hand than mine o thou infinite receive his soul in an instant the sword flashes in the air and when it falls it is red with adolescent blood when the war is ended we find our soldier returning in triumph but little cares he now for honor or fame he renounces his warlike career shaves his head dons a priestly garb devotes the rest of his days to holy pilgrimage never turning his back to the west where lies the paradise when salvation comes and whither the sun hastes daily for his rest critics may point out flaws in this story which is casuistically vulnerable let it be all the same it shows that tenderness pity and love were traits which adorned the most sanguinary exploits of the samurai it was an old maxim among them that it becometh not the fowler to slay the bird which takes refuge in his bosom this in a large measure explains why the red cross movement considered peculiarly christian so readily found a firm footing among us for decades before we heard of the geneva convention bakin our greatest novelist has familiarized us with the medical treatment of a fallen foe in the principality of satsuma noted for its martial spirit and education the custom prevailed for young men to practice music not the blast of trumpets or the beat of drums those clamorous harbingers of blood and death stirring us to imitate the actions of a tiger but sad and tender melodies on the biva a musical instrument resembling the guitar soothing our fiery spirits drawing our thoughts away from scent of blood and scenes of carnage polybius tells us of the constitution of arcadia which required all youths under thirty to practise music in order that this gentle art might alleviate the rigours of that inclement region it is to its influence that he attributes the absence of cruelty in that part of the arcadian mountains nor was satsuma the only place in japan where gentleness was inculcated among the warrior class a prince of shirakawa jots down his random thoughts and among them is the following though they come stealing to your bedside in the silent watches of the night drive not away but rather cherish these the fragrance of flowers the sound of distant bells the insect humming of a frosty night and again though they may wound your feelings these three you have only to forgive the breeze that scatters your flowers the cloud that hides your moon and the man who tries to pick quarrels with you it was ostensibly to express but actually to cultivate these gentler emotions that the writing of verses was encouraged our poetry has therefore a strong undercurrent of pathos and tenderness a well-known anecdote of a rustic samurai illustrates a case in point when he was told to learn versification and the warbler's notes was given him for the subject of his first attempt his fiery spirit rebelled and he flung at the feet of his master this uncouth production which ran the brave warrior keeps apart the ear that might listen to the warbler's song his master undaunted by the crude sentiment continued to encourage the youth until one day the music of his soul was awakened to respond to the sweet notes of the uguizu and he wrote stands the warrior mailed and strong to hear the uguizu's song warbled sweet the trees among we admire and enjoy the heroic incident in kerner's short life when as he lay wounded on the battlefield he scribbled his famous farewell to life incidents of a similar kind were not at all unusual in our warfare our pithy epigrammatic poems were particularly well suited to the improvisation of a single sentiment everybody of any education was either a poet or a poetaster not infrequently a marching soldier might be seen to halt take his writing utensils from his belt and compose an ode and such papers were found afterward in the helmets or the breastplates 
when these were removed from their lifeless wearers. End of chapter 5